Act Two of The Family of Love by Thomas Middleton, Thomas Decker, and Lording Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One A Room in Purge's House. Enter Purge. The grey-eyed morning braves me to my face and calls me sluggard. Tis time for tradesmen to be in their shops, for he that tends well his shop and hath an alluring wife with a graceful waddy alack shall be sure to have good doings. And good doings is that that crowns so many citizens with the horns of abundance. My wife, by ordinary course, should this morning have been at the family, but now her soft pillow hath given her counsel to keep her bed. Master Doctor should indeed minister to her, to whose pills she is so much accustomed, that now her body looks for them as duly as the moon shakes off the old and borrows new horns. I smile to myself to hear our knights and gallants say how they gull us citizens, when indeed we gull them, or rather they gull themselves. Here they come in term time, hire chambers, and perhaps kiss our wives. Well, what lose I by that? God's blessing on his heart, I say still, that makes much of my wife, for they were very hard favoured that none could find in his heart to love but ourselves. Drugs would be dog cheap, but for my private well-practised doctor and such customers? Tut! Jealousy is a hell. And they that will thrive must utter their wares as they can, and wink at small faults. Exit. Scene 2. A Street. Enter Gloucester. The tedious night is past, and the jocund morn looks more lively and fresh than an old gentlewoman's glazed face in a new periwig. By this time my humorous lover is at Gravesend, and I go with more joy to fetch his trunk than ever the valid Trojans did to draw in the Grecian jade. His god shall into the walls of my Troy, and be offered to a face more lovely than ever was that thrice-ravished Helen, yet with such caution that no danger shall happen to me. Exit. Scene 3. Another Street. Enter Lipsolve and Shrimp, meeting Gudgeon and Periwinkle. Master Lipsolve, welcome with intent. We two are so nearly linked that if thou beest absent but one two hours, thy acquaintance grows almost mouldy in my memory. And thine fly-blown in mine, how dost thou do? Fellow page, I think our acquaintance runs low too. But if it run not all the leads, let's set it a tilt and give him some dregs to their mouldy fly-blown compliments. No, rather let's pierce the rundlets of our running heads and give them a neat cup of wagship to put down their courtship. Courtship? Cartship. For the tongues of complimenters run on wheels, but mark em, they have not done yet. And if faith how it? Methinks thou hast been a long vagrant. The rogation hath been long indeed, Therefore we may salute as ceremoniously as lawyers when they meet after a long vacation, who, to renew the discontinued state tale, they stretch it out with such length, that whilst they greet before, their clients kiss them behind. If his nose were put in the remainder of that state tale, he would say to her an unsavoury one. I wonder why many men go so at the law. I'll tell thee, because they themselves have neither law or conscience. But what news now? How stands the state of things at Brussels? Faith, weak and limber, weak and limber, nothing but pride and double-dealing. Virtue is vices lackey, beggars suck like horse leeches at the heart of bounty, 
and leave him so tired and spur-galled that he can be no longer ridden with honesty. Well, fare the city yet. Their virtue rides a cock horse, cherished and kept warm in good stables and fox fur, and with the breath of his nostrils drives pride and covetousness before him like own shadow. Beggars have whipping cheer, bounty obliges men to it, and liberality gives money for scripts and scrolls, sealed with strong arms and heraldry to outlive mortality. Love there will see the last man born, never give over while there's an arrow in the quiver. Now we talk of love, I do know not far hence so good a subject for that humour, that if she would wear but the standing collar and her things in fashion, our ladies in the court were but brown sugar candy, as gross as grocery to her. She's not so sweet as apothecary shop, is she? A plague on you! Are you so good a scent? Aside. For my life, he's my rival. Her name begins with... Mistress Purge, does it not? True, the only comet of the city. Aye, if she would let her rough stream out a little wider. But I'm sure she is ominous to me if she makes civil wars and insurrections in the state of my stomach. I had thought to have bound myself from love, but her purging comfits makes me loose-bodied still. What? Has she ministered to thee, then? Faith some lectury or so. Aye, I fear she takes too much of that lectury to stoop to love. It keeps her body soluble from sin. She is not troubled with carnal crudities nor the binding of the flesh. Thou hast sounded her then, belike? Not I. I am too shallow to sound her. She's out of my element. If I show passion and discourse of love to her, she tells me I am wide from the right scope. She says she has another object and aims at a better love than mine. Oh, that's her husband. No, no, she speaks pure devotion. She's impenetrable. No gold or oratory, no virtue in herbs, nor no physic will make her love. More is the pity, I say, that fair women should prove saints before age and made them crooked. Aside, it is my luck to be cross still, but I must not give over the chase. Come hither, boy, while I think on't. Lipsalve talks apart to Shrimp. Faith, friend Lipsalve, I perceive you would fain play with my love, a pure creature tis for whom I have sought every angle of my brain. But either she scorns courtiers, as most of them do, because they are given to boast of their doings, or else she's exceeding straight lace. Therefore, to prevent this smell smock, now to my friend Dr. Glister, a man exquisite in art magic, who hath told me of many rare experiments available in this case. Farewell, friend Lipsalve. Adieu, honest Gregory. Frequent my lodging, I have a viol de gambo and good tobacco. Exit Gudgeon and Periwinkle. Thou wilt do this feat, boy? Else knock my head and my paint together. Away then, bid him bring his measure with him. Exit Shrimp. Geraldine is travelled, and I must be cast into his mould. My flesh grows proud, and Maria's a sweet wench, etc. But yet I must not let fall my suit with Mistress Perch, lest, sede vacante, my friend Gudgeon join issue. I'd rather to my learned doctor for a spell, for I have a fire in my liver burns like hell. Exit. Scene 4. A Room in Glister's House. Enter Mistress Glister and Maria. I pray let's have no polluted feet, no rheumatic chaps enter the house. I shall have my floor look more greasy shortly than one of your inn of court dining tables. And now to you, good niece, I bend my speech. Let me tell you plainly, you are a fool to be lovesick for any man longer than he is in your company. Are you so ignorant in the rules of courtship to think any one man to bear all the prick and praise? I tell thee, be he never so proper, there is another to second him. Let rules of courtship be authentic still, to such as do pursue variety. But unto those whose modest thoughts do tend 
to honored nuptials and a regular life as far from show of niceness as from that of impure thoughts all other objects seem of no proportion balanced with esteem of what their souls affect no marvel sure you should regard these men with such reverent opinion there's few good faces and fewer graces in any of them if one among a multitude have a good pair of legs he never leaves riding the ring till he has quite marred the proportion nay some as i have heard wanting lineaments to their liking and calf to support themselves are fain to use art and supply themselves with quilted calves which oftentimes in reveling fall about their ankles and for their behavior wit and discourse except some few that are traveled it is as imperfectious and silly as your scholars new come from the university by this light i think we lose part of our happiness when we make these weathercocks our equals disgrace not that for which our sect was made society and nuptials above these joys which lovers taste when their conjoined lips suck forth each other's souls the earth the air yea gods themselves know none elysium's sweet i all that bliss which poets pens describe are only known when soft and amorous folds entwine the core of two united lovers where what they wish they have yet still desire and sweets are known without satiety enter vile here's club forsooth and his fellow prentice have brought master geraldine's trunk let them come in if their feet be clean exit vile so then your best beloved is gone fair weather after him all thy passions go with him we comfort thyself wench in a better choice his love to thee would have been of no longer continuance than the untrussing of his foes then why shouldst thou pine for such a one maria aside she's foolish sure with what imperfect phrase and shallow wit she answers me enter club and another apprentice with a trunk honest club welcome is this master geraldine's trunk he is gone then ay indeed mistress glister he is departed this transitory city but his whole substance is here enclosed which by command we here deliver to your custody to the use of mistress maria according to the tenor of the premises place it here my honest club well done and how does thy mistress was she at the family today? Club spits. Spit not, good club. I cannot abide it. Not today, forsooth. She hath overcharged herself and her memory. She means to use a moderation and take no more than she can make use of. And I prithee, club, what kind of creatures are these familists? Thou art conversant with them? What are they? With reverence be it spoken, they are the most accomplished creatures under heaven. In them is all perfection. As how, good club? Omitting their outward graces, I'll show you only one instance, which includes all others. They love their neighbors better than themselves. Not than themselves, club. Yes, better than themselves, for they love them better than their husbands, and husband and wife are all one. Therefore better than themselves this is logic but tell me does she not endeavor to bring my doctor of her side and fraternity let him resolve that for himself for here he comes enter glister oh hast thou brought the trunk honest club i commend thy honest care here's for thy pains giving money i thank ye master doctor you are free and liberal still You'll command me nothing back? Nothing but commendations. Farewell. Exeunt club and apprentice. Your sweetheart, Geraldine, is by this time cold of his hope to enjoy thee. He's gone, and a more equal than able husband shall my care ere long provide thee. What clients have been here in my absence, wife? Faith, Mouse, none that I know more than an old woman that had lost her cat and came to you for a spell in the recovery. I think egregious ignorance will go near to save this age. Their blindness takes me for a conjurer. 
Yesterday a justice of peace salutes me with a proffer of a brace of angels to help him to his footcloth, some three days before stolen, and was fain to use his man's cloak instead on't. Re-enter Vile. Has a gentleman craved speech with you, sir? Go in, sweet wife, and give my niece good counsel. Exeunt, Mistress Glister, and Maria. His name? He will not tell it to me. His countenance? I can see nothing but his eyes. The rest of him is so wrapped in cloak that it suffers no view. Admit him. Exit vile. What should he be for a man? Enter Lipsol. What, Master Lipsol, is you? Why thus obscured? What discontent overshadows you? A discontent indeed, Master Doctor, which, to shake off, I must have you extend your art to the utmost bounds. You physicians are as good as false doors behind hangings to ladies' necessary uses. You know the very hour in which they have neither will to deny nor wit to mistrust. Faith now, by the way, when are women most apt? Shall I unbutton myself to you? After the receipt of a purgation, for then are their pores most open. But what creature of a quarter is it have drawn your head into the woodcock's noose? Courtier? Nay, by this flesh I am clean fallen out with them. They have nothing proportionable. Oh, I perceive. Then tis some city star that attracts your aspect. Lipsolve aside. He knows by his art. In plain terms, a certain apothecary's wife. Upon my life, Master Purges, I smell you, sir. You may smell a man after a purgation indeed, sir. "'Tis she. Now, for that fame hath bruited you to be a man expert in necromancy, I would endear myself to you forever, would you vouchsafe to let one of your spirits bring Mistress Purge into some convenient place, where I might enjoy her? I have heard of the like. Can you perform this?' With much facility, I assure you, but you must understand that the apparition of a spirit is dreadful, and with all covetous, and with no small sum of gold higher to such feats. Re-enter Vile. Sir, here's another gentleman, muffled, too, that desires present conference with you. Walk you into that room. I will bethink myself for your good, and instantly resolve you. Exit Lipsol. Let the gentleman come in. Exit Vile. Lipsolve in love with my vessel of ease, come to me to help him to a morsel most affected by mine own palate. No more but so, I have shaped it. The conceit tickles me. Enter Gudgeon. Sir, as a stranger, I welcome you. What, Master Gudgeon, have I caught you? I thought it was a gallant that walked muffled. Come, let me behold you at full. Here are no sergeants, man. Master Doctor, this my obscure coming requires an action more obscure, and in brief, this tis. Sir, you are held a man far seen in nature's secrets. I know you can affect many things almost impossible. Know then, I love Mistress Purge, and opportunity favours me not, nor indeed is she so tractable as I expected. If either by medicine or your art magical, you can work her to my will, I have a poor gallant's reward, sir. Glister, aside. That's just nothing. But how, sir, would you have me to procure you access to Mistress Purge? You never knew a physician aboard. Why, by conjuration, I tell you, wherein you are said to be as well practiced as in physic. Here's the best part of my present store to effect it. Giving money. Not a penny for myself, but my spirits. Indeed, they must be fed. Walk you by here, while I think upon a spell. Gudgeon retires. What mystery should this be? Lipsolve and Gudgeon, both in love with Mistress Purge, and come to me to help him by art magic. Tis some gullery, sure. Yet of my invention hold, I'll fit them. Who's within there? Enter servant. Fetch me, in all good haste, two good whips. I think you may have them not far hence. Exit, servant. Glister, aside. It shall be so. Now tell me, Master Gudgeon, does no man know of your love to Mistress Purge? 
not a man by my gentry. Then, sir, know I'll effect it, but understand withal the apparition will be most horrid if it appear in its proper form, and will so amaze and dull your senses that your appetite will be lost and weak, though Mistress Purge should attend it naked. Now, sir, could you name a friend with whom you are most conversant? In his likeness shall the spirit appear. Of all men living, my conversation is most frequent with Lipsal, the courtier. Tis enough. I'll to my spirit. Gudgeon retires, and Glister writes a few words. Are these whips come there? Enter servant with whips. Ready here, sir. Exit. Glister aside. So, lie thou there. My noble gallants, I'll so firk you. Sir, my spirit agrees in lipsalve shape. Tomorrow, twixt the hours of four and five, shall Mistress Purge be wrapped with a whirlwind into Lipsolve's chamber. That's the fittest place, for by the break of day Lipsolve shall be mounted and forsake the city for three days. So my spirit resolves me. Now, sir, by my art, at that very hour shall his chamber door fly open, into which boldly enter in this sort accoutred. Put me on a pure, clean shirt, leave off your doublet, for spirits endure nothing polluted, take me this whip in your hand, and being entered you shall see the spirit in lips of shape, in the self-same form that you appear. Speak these words, here ready written. Giving a paper. Take three bold steps forward, then whip him soundly, who straight vanisheth and leaves Mistress Purge to your will. Aye, but shall your spirit come armed with a whip too? He shall, but have no power to strike. Is this infallible? Have you seen the proof? Probatum, upon my word, I have seen the experience. If it fail, say I am a fool and no magician. Master Doctor, I would you had some suit of court. By the faith of a courtier, I would beg it for you. Very well, sir. I shall report of you as I find your charm. And no otherwise, sir. Let me understand how you thrive. Exit, Gudgeon. Ha ha ha! Now to my friend Lipsolve. I must possess him with the same circumstance, wherein I am assured to get perpetual laughter in their follies and my revenge. Exit. Re-enter Maria. Oh, which way shall I turn, or shift, or go, to lose one thought of care? No soothing hope gives intermission, or beguiles one hour of tedious time, which never will have end, whilst love pursues in vain my absent friend. Thou continent of wealth, whose want of store, for that it could not pease the unequal scale, of avarice givest matter to my moan, O dross! the level of insatiate eyes, the devil's engine and the soul's corrupter. Thou playest the attorney against the lawful force of true affection, dost interpose a bar, twixt hearts conjoined. Cursed be thy seeds of strife, whose progress chokes the natural course of life. Gerardine rises out of the trunk, while Maria retreats in alarm. Oh, help, help, help! Stay, sweet Maria. I bring thee ample joy to check that sudden fear. Let thy sweet heart, that constant seat of thy affection, repay that blood exhausted from thy veins. Oh, fear not, sweet wench. I have no apparition, but the firm substance of thy truest friend. Knowst thou me now? O oh, Geraldine, my love, what unheard of accident presents thy unexpected self? and gives my heart matter of joy mixed with astonishment. I thought thou hadst been cabined in thy ship, not trunked within my cruel guardian's house. That cruelty gives you to desire, for love suppressed fears like a raging fire which burns all obstacles that stop its course and mounts aloft. The ocean in its source may easier hide himself and be confined than love can be obscured, for in the mind she holds a seat and through that heavenly essence is near when far remote. Her virtual presence fills, like the air, all places, gives delight, hope and despair, and heart against fell despite. And that worst of men, thy cruel guardian, may keep down a while, but cannot dissipate what heaven hath joined. For fate and providence gave me this stratagem, 
to let him know that love will creep where tis restrained to go. I apprehend the rest, O oh rare conceit. I see thy travel happily was feigned to win access, which with small ease thou hast gained. This trunk, which he so greedily supposes, contains thy substance, as it doth indeed, upon thy fair pretense in lieu of love, bequeathed to me if death should stop the course. This trunk, I say, he hugs. Sink thou or swim, so he may feed his wolf, that root of sin, his avarice. But heaven, that mocks man's might, gives this close means to insist upon our right. Ingenious spirit, true oracle of love, thou hast prevented me. This was my plot, whose end and scope I longed to imitate with accents free and uncontrolled with fear. Does opportunity stand fair? Not now. Danger stands sentinel. Then I'll retire. We must be cautious. He goes again into the trunk. So, so, and time shall not oft turn his hourglass ere I'll find place and occasion fitting to thy mind. Exit. End of Act Two.